Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show this week. I'm so excited to bring you this bonus show. Um, different to our usual schedule of a Wednesday, Friday show, which, of course, they're still happening. But I'm very, very happy to be bringing you this show. If you have been with us since season one, you will know that back in season one, we spoke to this guest and I was very excited then. And we had a lot of kind of technical difficulties back in the day. And thankfully, we kind of a lot more on top of that. And this should be um, a lot, a lot better. And hello to you guys in the chat already. Thank you for your, for your comments. And please engage. Uh, if you remember, we are an inter interactive show and we kind of like your questions and comments coming in. So please do bring those with you. And you will notice there is no Mr. Hooley sat next to me. And it is a bit of a shame, but he's very, very busy. He has some family um, things to get ready for this week. And that's all exciting for him. But for me, that means I'm sat on my own, which I have you guys. But that is also great for me because I have a guest on that I'm very much uh, a fan of. So this should be fantastic. Um, thank you guys uh, for tuning in on the weekend as well. There's been a lot of great feedback for the shows last week. And in response to that show last week, I did say that we will be giving a copy of this away to our American audience because um, the prank by LV Matthews or Liv Matthews um, is not available in the US. And we didn't realize that at the time. And which a lot of you are US listeners or viewers that we kind of felt like this should be um, available to you guys. So the tweet competition we did, uh, thank you for all for entering. And we have given this book away and the winner of this and we will send it to you in America is uh, our very own Anya Paville. Uh, thank you so much for um, entering the competition and we will get this sent out to you. So please uh, DM me us your address and we will send it. So fantastic. Let me do the... Um, in fact, let me just talk about this very quickly. I know I want to get the guest on, um, but we appeared in the iTunes uh, charts this week. Um, 29th in the charts, but it was the Australian charts and we were 29th. And not that that's a bad thing um, in the book charts for Australia. So we've had a good spike there. Thank you to whoever that is watching that. Um, and uh, so let's move on to the book token, um, beer token book promotion. And this is the chance that you guys have to sponsor the show with your book okay and if you don't know about this go onto our website the writing community chat show.com and have a look at it because it's a great way to sponsor and show your support the show and show your work off so this is someone we've had previously as a sponsor so he's definitely pushing this book in the right places before it gets its release and it looks fantastic and i'm glad that i can actually try and bring in the video of this this week because last time we did it it wasn't working properly so it does actually uh he sent me the actual file so this week's book is from Marcus Acker, which you will know from, he's, he's been on the show. It was um, the, the Idiot on the Writer's Block, his YouTube channel is fantastic for books as well. Cool, 1-800-KILLER-GUY, and we mentioned before, it's very, very Sin City-esque. Um, so, Cool, 1-800-KILLER-GUY is the first book of three written by Marcus and from the Culliver City Chronicles, a near no, near crime graphic novel series set in the fictitious, fictitious American city uh, of Culliver. Um, that has been co-opted by criminals for criminals an entire infrastructure has been secretly established to allow crime to thrive within the city limits with its own laws unknown to civilians but branded into citizens who make up around 70 percent of the city's population uh, the call 1-800 killer guy story arc focuses on the contract killer market in the city and it's released on the 5th of april and it is available to to pre-order now so please do go and check that out and what i will do is i will play that video for you right now so get your taste buds going for this fantastic looking uh, the book that has a fantastic trailer. So here it is. Culver City, USA. A city co-opted by criminals for criminals. With its own rules, its own laws, unknown to civilians, branded into citizens. Much blood was spilled over decades to keep the secret as well as the peace. These chronicles reveal that secret. Read with care and prepare for the war that comes. Culver City Chronicles. Call 1 800 Kill a Guy. Book One coming soon. I am absolutely loving that and think it's an absolutely fabulous trailer. Uh, Marcus, well done to you. And um, 
indeed love the Sin City vibes. It is fantastic. And the prep and the artwork for that is really good. So please, if you haven't seen it, check it out on his Twitter. Um, but let's get on with tonight's show because I'm very excited. And tonight's guest, um, if you remember from season one, you, you will know what this man's about and how, how much he brings uh, to the industry. But he's an award-winning uh, writer, producer, editor and director who's brought us the amazing We're Alive audio drama and as well as worked on Bronzeville and much, much more. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Casey Wayland. Hello. Hi, um, Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I am so, so happy that you've joined us. And again, thank you so much. Um, like we just talked briefly before coming on air, going back to season one was a long time ago now, and I'm glad things have much improved. And it's happy to see you uh, still still going down the same direction of producing amazing content. Thank you. Yeah, and no, I've uh, been going strong. Uh, even during COVID, it's been a lot of work, but uh, <laughs> good for for some things. I mean, I will say that uh, I actually got, I think, more writing done last year than I had in any other year. So that's that's, that's a plus in my, in my space. That definitely is. I think, um, um, you say my space, like your physical space, <laughs> not the app. In, in uh, my head space, I yeah. guess. Yeah, I think of it um, that way. No, my space is way gone. <laughs> oh, it's a long time gone. Uh, yeah, definitely. But there has, there's definitely been a surge in, I mean, creative content in, in lockdown. So that actually has helped your uh, your industry at the moment? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's gotten a little complicated on the, uh, the producing side. Like recording some of these things has been a, kind of a nightmare uh, doing things under COVID conditions. But in terms of the creative space... Uh, the nice thing is uh, last year I had sort of lined up a couple gigs in early like February ish uh, that kind of propelled me and kept me working throughout the entire uh, new year. So, yeah, I've been I've been working on those ever since and a, a couple others uh, at the same time. It's it's been nice. Uh, the audio space especially has been given a lot more attention because more and more people are able to do some of these uh, projects because of remote recording. Yeah, uh, so it's it's been just kind of a, a little bit of a bubble inflating more and more. Amazing, it really is. Um, before I get carried away, can we jump back into a bit of history about yourself? Because I know you've you've come a long way and you've done a, a lot of projects, but can we try and give a little bit of a summary for those people that might be watching that don't know who you are and, and want to figure out how you came to to do what you're doing? How did you start off with your career, and how has that led to? poster behind you uh from gold rush how is how yeah i spotted that one um how has it led to that and and you know how's that journey been sure so uh it's been a long journey to get to the point where i'm at now i've, I've sort of done a multitude of everything that's, that's got me here i'll try and cover it very quickly and in, in, in uh fast capacity um so i essentially was a, a writing directing student i've always wanted to do fi uh, films was sort of what i went to college for um, because I wasn't able to afford college 100% back when I was going, and because of a couple other reasons, I ended up going in the military, uh, becoming a broadcast engineer, uh, getting deployed overseas, and then came back and finished off my degree. So I have mm. sort of a, a weird technical background because I have the broadcast engineering side, and I finished off uh, getting a, a BFA in writing and directing. So I have a little bit of a mix of both. Um, and uh, part of my BFA, I did short films, I did feature documentaries, uh, and it did animation and animation opened up the world to me because uh, I really love creating something from nothing. That was really fun. Um, but then for one of the projects that I did, the animation wasn't nearly as good as doing the audio side of things, yeah. which sort of opened up another door of saying, oh, well, what happens if you were actually just to create a audio only program and make that the, the primary focus of the, the story? Hmm. And so that's where sort of where life came from is is this idea where I could tell a much larger story than I was able to do before, uh, do a multicast scenario where you record all the, the actors together and tell a much bigger story like that. And so we're alive started back in 2009. It yeah. went until uh, well, still going until 2019. We did a gold rush, but there's a couple more in the works right now. Um, and can, can I, I just can I just awesome. jump in there as well that, that you know, when you started doing this in 2009, there wasn't a massive wealth of audio dramas around, was there? So, no, so how did you like just a handful, really? Yeah. So what was your inspiration to, to apart from obviously working in animation and thinking, stumbling on the, the audio side of things and kind of falling in love with that? Was there actual inspiration from anything else at the time that you were you were inspired by? Well, there was a there was a couple out there that I had listened to uh, and I thought they did a, a pretty good job in the storytelling department. Uh, but 
because of this like sound design was my big uh emphasis those like these just don't sound like they're real to me it sounds yeah. like because the, the thing about sound is it's all about finding the right perspective and making sure that you can follow everything and all the actions uh and oftentimes they also alluded to getting away from that like a lot of uh, people who do storytelling in the audio medium love to have a narrator tell you everything that you need to, yeah. to experience instead of actually you being part of the story so I, I came at it in a different capacity where i said okay i want to make this more interactive more like you're part of the world that mm -hmm. everything's happening around you and you're in the space with the characters um so there was there was some inspiration and, and i was a big fan of, of things like uh listening to jim dale's harry potter like that version of that and so I have, was familiar with some of the storytelling mediums, but I felt yeah. like there's there's a way to do it a little better. It just I mean, it, yeah, it's a very fine line, though, when you said people like to show you a lot or, or describe everything. But there's also a way of doing it with too much uh, from the audio side of things and trying to let people figure it out where you get lost a little. But We're Alive especially and um, Bronzeville is it's a fantastic way of it does run away with some audio in 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 the story but you know what's going on and it pulls you back in at the right time because i have listened to other things that really goes off and you're trying to figure out what actually is happening so there is a real fine line between the two of those things yeah uh, you, confusion is the killer of audio drama, yeah sort definitely. of one of my little phrases <laughs> so you had started off where alive um which for people are watching that might not know uh, is a fantastic audio drama um about a group of people surviving a zombie apocalypse and i mean your military history clearly was an, um, an inspiration again behind some of the story, right? Oh, big time. Yeah, no, it just kind of it gave the grounding of a story in reality. Because uh, a lot of the times I've, I've read a lot and listened to and watched a lot of stories about people who think they understand what soldiers would do or how they act. And they all feel, feel like really like, you know, placeholders or stick figures or they don't feel like people. They don't yeah. feel like they're real uh, and organic in that way. And so I, I kind of used a lot of my background and perspective of my military time to say, no, mm. people in the military are very real. They, they, you know, they all come from a variety of different backgrounds. They come from all walks of life and they all have a different perspective. And, and that was sort of like the starting point uh, and kind of built from there around these core central characters. Mm. And I imagine that building a, a base, a fan base for something like we're alive back in 2009, that was, quite difficult to do when social media wasn't as big as it is now and it, there wasn't that fan base there so how did you find that as a battle uh not just producing all the hours and hours of content because working with audio is very difficult and very time consuming so how did you justify that with an audience that was very very limited and growing at that time uh i always sort of felt uh that if you build it they will come that sort of feel the <laughs> yeah. dreams perspective uh, where like as long as you're telling a good story, as long as you're keeping consistency and you know where you're going, eventually people will arrive and um, kind of still doing that. Yeah, where you definitely. can actually still build a story, you know, get more people involved. And, you know, as long as you maintain that quality, people will still jump in. So as as we are still going through this journey and we're talking about we're alive and, you know, mentioning Gold Rush behind you, uh, that fan base has grown and grown in, in sort of all areas. And to the point where people speculate sort of ideas about what can happen and, you know, what they think should happen. So how hard is it between seasons of We're Alive to produce content that fans, hardcore fans are actually happy with? Was that was that something you factored in? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. I mean, one of the things I will say about Gold Rush is it's it was our story that like it was it was something that I'd been wanting to tell for a while. Um, from way back when, when because uh, it follows a, a small subsect of the story uh, mm. and, and four, four soldiers in particular and their journey that they go on. Um, and I've, I've been wanting to tell that kind of story for a while. And uh, it was one of these things where I, I kind of knew that in some ways, and there's some fans that kind of get polarized by it in some ways because it's not the main storyline. It's something mm. a little bit more fun. It's a little bit more campy. It's a little bit more uh more humor based but also a little it's 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 kind of like a tragic tale that we get to tell on the side of things um but it also will help fill in and form the narrative for the next iteration of the series so people don't really know all the stuff that we're planning inside of that one for the bigger next picture so it's a Absolutely. bit of a mix you you want to you want to obviously please the people that you're creating uh for but also at the same time is you also have to have some sort of auteurism and some genuine background of what you want to tell otherwise if you're just writing for the fans and you're just going to be chasing something that's that may be directionless or has a thousand different voices instead of a, a really co uh, concentrated one. 
So alongside We're Alive, you actually wrote um, Bombs Always Beep. Uh, um, have you got a copy? Yeah. Yes, there it is. And <laughs> that is a, a comp- <laughs> yes, brilliant. And that is a complete guide to, I guess, working with sound and production uh, that you have from your, drawn from your experiences. And at what point of the journey did you start writing this? Was it during We're Alive, or was it sort of um, you always kind of knew that you had that knowledge with inside you to write that? I, I started it back in uh, the later stages of We're Alive because one of the things I was running into is that uh, there's a lot of people that kind of come and go in terms of the production crew and the, the the sound teams behind the forces of the different audio dramas that I was creating. And I felt like there was sort of sometimes an inconsistency of like how I can tell everybody about all the aspects of, of making this. Because yeah. even though it is one dimensional in terms of it's just audio, it's so much more that goes into making sure it's clear. Because that's the biggest mm. thing is making sure that you're doing something from the storytelling perspective from the sound design perspective, even the Foley, all these things contribute to painting that that aural picture in a listener's mind. And there's so many details that can get right and wrong. And, and there's a post-production workflow and all these little details that I kind of got tired of sort of reiterating over and over and over to a variety of different people. So instead of like uh, having just a different message every time, I said, okay, let's organize these thoughts, put them all into a, a book that probably will help other people as well Uh, Because the more people that produce in this medium, the bigger the medium ultimately becomes. So Mm. while while in some ways I I created in a selfish sense of being like, here's our production manual to be able to pass down to next person. I'd also wanted to bring in other people into the the, the spectrum of audio. And uh, what are you doing to create? How can you do it better? Because really, I've I've listened to a lot of different stuff and uh, there's a lot of good stuff and there's a lot of bad stuff out there. So I wanted to kind of contribute a little bit how to make them a little bit better in in some direction yeah it's fantastic and obviously it's writing a book is obviously very different whether it's fiction or non-fiction to sort of writing audio dramas because that is so dependent on character voice and in narration so how did you find that transition between the two and is it something you kind of struggled with or was it quite kind of a simple process for you uh it was actually a little bit of a struggle because i'm actually not used to writing in sort of the manuscript format of like mm-hmm. here's the god perspective of like you have to be 100 percent correct with your grammar you know, everything has to actually follow a, a certain set of rules and and standards of of how you write these things whereas in the dialogue world because i love writing dialogue because inherently it can never be wrong as long as it comes from the character so yes. when I'm I'm writing some slack jaw yokel in Western times, <laughs> who's like, I don't think we need to go in that little place. And like, you can just go off about like whatever you want to do. And as long as it comes from the character, it's never wrong. I love that freedom. And so yeah. writing a book like this is like, no, you can't do that. It has to be the right, you know, right prose. It has to be the right, uh, the verbiage has to be correct. And so that was a little bit of a transition. Um, and so I, I sort of had a little bit of some, some struggles in there, but I had some great editors who helped me along the way to make sure that it was consistent, it was mm. not repetitive, and it sort of stayed on target uh, for, for what I, the message that I wanted to get out there. Yeah, I can imagine that, you know, I'm, I'm the type of person that's quite slack in, if, if I find, if, no, in the way that if I knew I didn't have to write the dialogue to perfection because it's in a book, then mm-hmm. I would probably very loosely write that. Uh, and if that's something like kind of what you did, how did the actors um, receive that sort of word in? Did they, because it's a big process with the actors in, in, in your um, audio dramas, how did they respond to that sort of work? Are they quite adaptive to that? Yeah, they are for the most part. I mean, we're also, the, so there's the words on the page and then the words they sort of come out when they're, when they're performing it. Uh, in the beginning, uh, I sort of uh, had some, you know, growing pains in terms of like how you write dialogue, how you write interactions with people. Um, and it's it's to the point now where I can just write and hear exactly what it's going to sound like when I'm done. Uh, so it's gotten a little bit better. And I, I sort of give them a starting block. But there's sometimes where like we were on set uh, and the, the, the character's like, you know what? I wouldn't say ain't here. And I'm like, exactly. Take it out. You know, change it. Make it make it your own. Uh, if there's something that feels off for your character, just don't go with it. Because sometimes yeah. the voice that I hear in my head isn't exactly the voice that they're going to give me an exact mm. characterization that they're thinking of. Uh, and that sort of starts the collaborative process of production because it's there's stuff that you write and the stuff that you produce, and you have to make sure that they both come together in a, and they're compatible with each other. Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing for me when I wrote my book that 
it was turned into a, a an audiobook and I struggled really badly with trying to find the right voice in my head with a with a voice actor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean that was quite a difficult thing for me, and I know a lot of um, people who've written books are kind of similar. So, were you just happy to sort of let okay, this person will be this person, or were you really looking for that kind of person that sounded like it to you? It's a little mix of both, uh, and I think it's actually become a process that I've gotten a little bit better at because of the interactiveness that happened with the original We're Alive series. Mm. Uh, Very few authors could ever have the character, write the character, then cast the character, record the character, and then come back and write more material for them. Because then you actually have their voices in your head. Um, And in the beginning, we were like a little bit loose of like, okay, what is this character going to sound like? It may be like this. And so, but as the series went on and progressed, it was super easy to all of a sudden dial in those characters because I'm I'm editing them as well. And so I'd be like, okay, I can hear them then I can write them and then we'll record them. And as long as it matches in my ear of what I'm thinking about, mm. it makes it a little easier. So, I mean, I've been lucky in that sense. Uh, and I do say that like if authors like can't get to that sort of like block where they can't hear their characters, start making them sound like characters that they can hear. Like if there's, <laughs> yeah. a, if there's something that you can like identify with, like, even if it's like a Sean Connery or a James Bond or whatever it is that you need to assign to that character in your head to be able to hear them, then they'll start speaking to you. And that's the best mm. thing I think as a, especially a dialogue writer is when your characters start speaking to you, then it it's becomes uh, like it, they start uh, writing the books themselves in a way. Mm. Is there anything then, uh, uh, you know, thinking on that, that you were writing for a character and because of that character's personality, you then change the dialogue for? Oh, yeah. No, especially with like We're Alive, it's, uh, in particular, like the character of Datu uh, mm-hmm. originally was going to be a character called Jesus, which was very <laughs> different uh, and actually in some ways ended up becoming a character later on in Victor in the later part of the series. Uh, I, I ended up changing the character completely to uh, somebody who was from uh, Luzon, who had a, a Filipino background. Uh, to better give them, uh, you know, a little bit more because it, it was the one character that we were casting that we found a great voice for, and I'm like, hey, let's just change the character to yeah. match this to to better serve the purposes of the story, and that way it sort of bridged that gap. And it, you always come into finding different actors. You're like, I didn't hear this voice before, mm-hmm. but I do now, and I can't separate it. I mean, Datu's got to be a fan favorite, right? Oh yeah, no, Datu has his own little following. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of people love that character. And it, it, it's also because it's like a genuineness uh, mm. in the evolution of that character. And it just became uh, a little bit more real as the story went on. I mean, I, there's a lot to talk about. So I want to try and um, move on the best I can without kind of leaving things behind as well. But one of the real special things about um, We're Alive is, you know, when they were stuck in the tower and when they were going on these journeys together, it was all about the community and the spirit between and, and the characters. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't so much about what they were actually doing um but it was pulled off in a real way that you really cared about all the characters so how do you as a writer really get someone to connect with the characters whether it's in a book or whether it's in a, an audio drama to the point where you know you don't want that character to do this or you, you know you really feel a connection to them i think it comes from a, a place where you try and make characters as real as possible mm-hmm. um there are archetypes that people create all the time like oh this is this type of character this is this type of character and I have listened and read and watched stuff where it's like they are that box of a character. It fits it within their square and they don't feel real at all. I, I think that whenever you are trying to create somebody, you're not actually just creating a character. You're creating an entire uh, person like they have to have a background. They have to have a, a place where they grew up, like depending on what time of the year you were born, yeah. generally actually affects you for the rest of your life. You may not know it. <laughs> Like literally like some kids who are born in certain like uh, parts of the year have a better advantage in going to sports because of the different seasonal qualities and the locations in which they grew up in uh, also kind of sort of uh, hinder or encourage other parts of their growth. Like what was their background growing up? Were they what kind of students were they in school? Like who are their parents? All these things help inform a real person and really formulates what that person is in real life. So I genuinely say to people, um, if they're having a hard time finding who those characters are and creating somebody like that, just to grab inspiration from real life. You Mm -hmm. know these people. You've had experiences with all these types of people before uh, and pull from that. Like I I had a really uh, sort of a fortunate experience of being in the military because I'm like, you know what? I've had that officer that is Angel. So grab that sort of interaction that you had with them 
Uh, and I've had other soldiers who are very much like Saul around me. And I grabbed character personas from that. And I just built onto that and created those things out of the real inspirations from life. Because that's the greatest thing you can ever do as a writer. As a writer is observant. He watches the world and he takes the pieces out of it that, that really uh, contribute to his writing or her yeah. writing. Well, I definitely understood that when I when I listened to the series, um, you know, over over and again, um, that all the characters really have in the military. You get this where there are so many people from different areas and backgrounds that they're never very similar. And that's no. what a really great complex, uh, complex nature in the, uh, where alive is the fact that everyone's got their own real strong personalities from different areas, whether they're strong or weak in terms of their abilities or emotions. And it, it really shines through. Yeah, um, giving giving characters weaknesses. That's yeah. something that a lot of writers don't like to do is like, what is their internal flaw? Like Peg's not using a weapon. Everyone hates me for that choice. But really, <laughs> it's one of the most interesting choices because yeah. uh, there is a reason behind that you won't pick up a gun. And it's an incredibly good reason. And you can't falter if you ever learn it. And we haven't really focused on it in the story as a mainstay because... Uh, some some things in characters don't come to the surface until mm. it's naturally presented, and it didn't naturally present itself yet in the narrative of We're Alive. So, before we move on from We're Alive, um, th there are people that are going to want to know about Descendants a bit more. Is there anything that we can talk about with that? Sure. Uh, it's half of a season is recorded. Uh, we were able to actually record half of it before COVID hit. Okay. And then afterwards, uh, it unfortunately sort of devastated the funding block that we were on. And so it's got a lot of delays, unfortunately. Like, I was hoping to get it out last year um, before everything sort of fell apart. Yeah. And uh, I've had to work on other projects to kind of keep the, uh, the production machines going while we sort of get that, that funding source back. Mm. I mean, it's, it is a very tricky time. And you'd think that... Um just having audio and the ability to, to record you know, virtually would help in these situations. But the funding is still the same. You know, there's still the same cost and the fact is that other people and their lives, what's going on in their lives. So there's so many f things that come into that one problem. That, yeah, um, when we started We're Alive, like we would do it for very, very, very cheap. People yeah. would donate their times. We would give them, basically pay them with food and a travel stipend and, and hopefully build it from there. Uh, and as we've gotten a little bit more successful, uh, I need to pay the editors more for their time mm. if you're going to get a good package. Um, and also myself, like when I was first doing We're Alive, I would be I would be editing everything also on top of having another editor. Uh, but I would spend literally uh, like I'd have on 60, 80 hour weeks just trying to get these things out. And I can't do it anymore with a kid and you know a family and, and continually do more projects. So it's, it's one of these things where you, you have to have the, the, the money machine be able to, to do this because as you get bigger, it, people don't work for free. They look at this and say, oh, why am I doing this for free? And if you want original music compositions, you need editors, you need you know people to cast it. And, and, and as much as I love the ability to record people remotely, I absolutely despise it in the, pack, in the fact of like production sense because then you have all these different environments trying to match it. And my ear is is good enough to where I can go. They're not in the same room together. They're not interacting <laughs> yeah. together. And also, it people's houses sound like garbage. And so you're mm. dealing with like, oh yeah, I, you know, I gotta do all this cleanup before you ever get to the crux of the the editing, which is the drama. Does the drama work? Do these, you know, does it feel like this drama is working this part? And like we have tons of alternate takes like we just did a scene uh for descendants we just got the voice cut done for one of them recently uh because it's we're still working on it slowly as we're trying to pull in the funding sources which knock on wood should be uh hammered out soon um but to get all those alternate takes to work and and to get these lines to match up like no i, I want i want this special inflection done on this line where it means something more because there's mm. There's always what the character is saying and what the character means, and they're not always the same. And the performance is where you get that. And so that's that's where it's really tricky. And also character introductions. You can only introduce them once. So it's it's one of these things where uh, I've almost become so picky that it just takes a little bit longer to get the thing done. <laughs> but, you know, you know, that's just growth in, in your industry, because the very first time you hear a character is that instant connection. And especially at the start of a podcast, you're talking about building the history. But the mm -hmm. first interaction, you almost decide whether you want to listen to that show or not. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, you're the first episode is the only chance you get 
to either get your audience in there or lose them altogether. Absolutely. And uh, like literally Descendants, the first chapter, because uh, we recorded five of them already, uh, which will be split up into different parts. But uh, that first chapter, I went through 24 different drafts. Wow. Just trying to get everything right. Like uh, this scene didn't work here. Move it over. How do I establish and do an entire world build mm. that progresses a story? Uh, was it 17 years in the future? Like there's a lot of ground to cover and a lot of characters to introduce and a lot of things to catch the audience up on. Uh, and you don't have a lot of pages. How do you do it economically? How do you and also propel the new story forward in a way that's interesting? I mean, do you th this is a bold statement, but do you think this, you know, audio drama to get that right is even more difficult than, say, TV, because you're relying on the visuals as well, where audio drama, you don't have that. Yeah, I'd say it's a little bit trickier mm. uh, because you can't rely like when we're talking about an establishing shot in a film. Five seconds on the screen, you know where the location is, you know the time, you yeah. know who's in the location, everything else. In audio, I have to establish the location separately sometimes. Like, oh, if they're in a train station, you have the, the whistle of the train. Now who's in the scene? I got to establish who's in the scene somehow. How do you do that? Is this in the past, present, future? Like, establish the time or where they're coming from, where they're going. Mm -hmm. All these little details sort of go into the mechanics of building out that scene. And a lot of times, audios, audio dramas and writers will just rush. They'll be like, oh, hit blap. This is where we're at. And the, the audience <laughs> is like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm trying to figure all this stuff out. And if the audience is trying to figure mm -hmm. out things, they're not focusing on what you need them to. And that's it's, it does get technical in that way. Uh, well, there's a lovely book there to describe all that. Um, <laughs> so if we can talk about uh, Bronzeville then. Yeah. Because you play a part with Bronzeville. And if I'm right, you're producing that show? I produce and I also directed a, a good chunk of it. Okay. So I sort of had a, a multi multi uh, faceted role in that to make sure it got across the finish line and it's it's being released now. Uh, it is. So didn't, yeah. get the, didn't write this one, uh, but in some ways I like that because <laughs> yeah. then, then you, get a, you, get, you get to put on different hats and then you're not responsible for, you can actually go to the writer and say, what did you mean by that? Yeah. And they have to answer. Whereas before it's like, I gotta look at me. You know, that's <laughs> a mean, lot of hats are you able to describe it slightly for the people before we talk about it so that they can understand what we're talking about here sure so uh bronzeville is about 1947 chicago in the the, the black metropolis which is uh back at the time in, in in early u.s history they did a lot of segregations where they literally split the town uh amongst their black and white populations uh and at this this point in history uh, you couldn't get a loan if you were black. Uh, there was a lot of a lot of uh, segregation, a lot of uh, racism that just kind of like was intrinsic in society. And they established this place of, of Brownsville, which you could get a loan. You could do all this stuff. And then also what it gave a rise to is actually uh, the policy wheel, which is like a lottery system. So it kind of made like gangsters mm. in a way. Um, and the story that we're telling at Bronzeville is somebody who's coming up from the South, running from the law and trying to, you know, better themselves and get ahead of this world uh, and and gets involved in behind the scenes in this this these this gangster like world, uh, which in some ways actually puts money back into the community. So they're not yeah. as like bad guys. They're sort of this in between uh, opportunists in this world. And we get to paint their story of what they do mm. inside the world of, uh, of Bronzeville. I mean, I. <clears throat> to be honest with you, I wasn't massively aware of this show. Uh, and when I looked into it and started listening to it, I absolutely binged this show. And <laughs> I, I've loved it. And I, I'm going to be honest with you, I've still got two shows left to finish season one. And oh, I, was, okay. I, was, I was devastated that I couldn't finish it in time because I wanted to know, I kind of get where this is going. And to be honest with you, if you haven't listened to this and it, Halo said it sounds fascinating, it really is. And it gives such a good perce perception of perhaps what the times were like then and uh, as you said, Casey, that the the people that in this story, they kind of stuck in between a rock and a hard place, and they're trying to progress, yeah. but then being cast off of these evil people almost. And it's a really good um, a, a good story with. And we talked about how important good characters and voices, the actors uh, in, in this show, are, they're unbelievable. Yeah, and... it's been, it's a phenomenal all star cast, and we build <laughs> yeah. on that with the second season. We just say, okay, well, here's what we did in first season. Let's get even more people involved, get some yeah. really fun characters, uh, people that I would, you know, it's 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 nice because also I have other producers uh, mm -hmm. like Laurent Tate and uh, Lorenz Tate 
uh, and Helen Suglin, who can who have a, a much bigger Rolodex of contacts and can bring in some amazing people yeah. uh, behind. And they hear Lawrence Fishburne's involved in the project. And they go, "Where? Wh wh when are we recording?" Yeah, I mean, instantly that voice, mm -hmm. even on on TV, holds the room. But when you hear it on a podcast or on an audio drama, when it's this tension in the room, you're like, "Wow, that just really comes across so well." He's got um, just a, a natural voice and ability, and it just. It's fun because it, it, we start at the level that's already there and we just get a little bit higher. It's really yeah. nice. So uh, coming from someone, as you said, that was directing, writing and producing your own show to step into a world with a big cast and other producers and things like this. How did you feel going into that world? And, and did you feel that you could put your stamp on it? And were you afraid to do that? Uh, it, it was a little intimidating at first. And also, uh, I also had to help translate a little bit for the people working on this project what it is that we needed for the pieces of the puzzle to fit when it's all together. Yeah. Uh, because when I when I have uh, actors go in front of a microphone and say, here are your generic lines, which are just like a bunch of, okay, all right. <sighs> and then breathings and sighs <laughs> and coughs and all these weird little things are like, what does this matter? And I'm like, it matters because it, it's how the pieces come together later mm -hmm. on. Uh, so to translate that and also like stuff with, uh, cause we worked with uh, Josh Olson, who is uh, an, like an Academy Award nominated writer and a really amazing uh, author. And uh, to get him to understand like what some of the things you can and can't do in an audio medium uh, can be a little tricky. And sometimes he'll challenge you with certain scenes that you're like, how do I, how, how can we build this around? <laughs> Um, because also to make these places feel like they're alive, you go into a ballroom scene. Sure. You got your primary characters, but then you have all those extra characters in the background that are just, you know, doing their walla bits that are distinct to a certain time and place that if you're actually paying attention to what they're saying, uh, cause in the audio world, you can't get away with anything. You, you, mm. you can't, you know, a murmur in the background and audio doesn't really work. It has to be really specific. So it is a, there was a lot of hurdles to go over and a lot of translation things and, and uh, just to get everyone in the same space at the same time to record together. It's just a, a really complicated process. So it was, it was difficult to do, uh, but ultimately it paid off. And then he's just kind of, once they get used to it, like even season two was even better because then they're like, oh, we've done this before. Let's just do it again. And they just mm. kind of built up from there. I was going to ask, how did the actors um, sort of receive this kind of work? Because for a lot of people, this is, it is a new step and, um, you know, they embraced it, obviously, because it's worked very, very well. But how did they adapt from, say, the screen to this and using those little things like why why am I doing a breath? Because it affects the audio. <laughs> yeah. You know, how, how do they adapt to that? Uh, some people do it really well. Like some people because the, the way that I direct and the way that I sort of look at this is people are like, oh, it's voiceover acting. I'm like, no, yeah. you know, voiceover acting and acting are two different things. Uh, like I've gotten many auditions where they'll start to do a voice and they'll try to talk like this. And it, like they, they, they're so technically trained for like a radio, like advertisement that yeah. they actually forget that. No, it just needs to come from a natural place. So there are some of the times that you have to like translate that over to, to give somebody that, 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 that proper inspiration. But a lot of them got it really quickly because these mm. are really professional actors. Um, and I think that interactive quality of when you get people in the same space and time and they're interacting with each other and they're reacting in the same space, they just get it. And everyone starts to get on the same page. You, you, you do one take, you do a second take and possibly a third. And by the third take, they're so into the scene that they're, they're like going back to their most natural acting abilities. It's almost like, Hey, I don't have to hold for camera. I mm. jump into my character. I get behind a mic and I am that person. And in some ways, it becomes the the most like primal acting space that is available to an actor. Yeah, it really does. It fascinates me because you get so much more emotion through the voice uh, when it's in an audio drama. Um, but do you just one more before we have to move on to uh, the next section? But do you really think that having such big cast actors like this in an audio drama now and people like, uh, you know, Neil Gaiman's. Um, Sam man, uh, Sam man, fantastic, fantastic series. Um, yeah, by Dirk Mags, just a really great soundscape and a lot um, of lot of characters in there. Unbelievable. Um, but do you think these sort of actors coming into these sort of audio dramas will really propel it? Because I do think that it's still an untapped resource almost. Because I think there's so much more people out there that would love this if they if they kind of knew about it. I mean, that sounds a bit silly, but I'm not sure. I think that this it's got a lot of scope to be become a lot bigger. 
It does. And I, I will, uh, there's like an asterisk on that though, because mm. I love working with actors who've already been established and they know how to do what they need to do. I mean, you're already coming into a place where you don't have to direct as much. <laughs> and honestly, like, like uh, I just did a, a project that uh, uh, I might talk about a little bit later that um, I had some, some big name actors in there that are the primary roles. And I wrote for these roles and like, they would sometimes hit the performance on the head for the first time. And I'm like, okay, let's just get one more take for safety and we're done. And we'll move on to the next scene. And so like wow. that happens a lot. Uh, and it's really awesome when, when you have that opportunities, the asterisk that always is applied to this is when you're dealing with somebody who has a big name, you're dealing with scheduling issues. Now you're dealing with some casting, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes difficulties, like being able to get a hold of that person, getting, getting through the agent process of like, Oh yeah, now I actually see these roles. Um, so there is a little bit of a hurdle to, to do that. Um, and then also I think to get everyone in the time and space together and to make these things sound, sound natural. Um, I think that oftentimes it's like a disservice of like when you record everybody separate and they don't get to interact and they don't have that, that genuine feeling because realistically, like when, when I get to have those characters in the same space and they're interacting with each other, you do less, you have to, it's less work in yeah. post and it's less work to direct them. Uh, and you get to spend more time making the roles better. So it's almost like it would be here, but it could be at a higher level if you give all these things available. And to get them in that space, like the asterisk says, it's it's sometimes difficult. Amazing. It really does fascinate me how it all works together. And I think it's a, a wonderful, wonderful series. And season two clearly is just dropped recently. I think it's uh, two episodes out of season two now, which I, I can't wait to get into. So I'm very excited. It's um, going to break your heart. That first <laughs> oh, don't like, say that. No joke. Oh. Uh, I, I, I was I was directing one of the actors in that that first scene. And, and I made the uh, the executive producer. Well, I, I didn't do it. The actor did it. They made the ex executive producer cry in the booth. And I'm like, uh, my job's done. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly the kind of like when you when you, when the feeling in the booth is so raw and emotional and yeah. then you get to add everything around it and you just make it even better. Uh, it's It's like this is one of the reasons why this medium can be so powerful is because you get to be with these characters in the time and space. Mm. And that can really draw an audience in, in a way that, that really the visual spectrum can't because they'll see it in their mind uh, as beautiful as it is. Yeah. Well, I can't wait, but um, I'm going to have to get some tissues on the ready by the sounds of it. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to move on slightly. We'll have a few questions from the community. Um, we, do you know what? We did ha even have a quiz um, for, for you to beat Chris Hooley with, but he's oh, not here. Oh, uh, oh, okay. I'll take the quiz still. I mean, if it's for me, but I don't, do you know what you know what we could do we could get someone from the audience to join in with you i, I wouldn't mind if they're up for it um i could do it with you but i know the answers uh so oh okay well, <laughs> that'd be cheating <laughs> that, that would be cheating um so what we're going to do play a little video and we're going to introduce a new family member to the show because people that follow us we like to give them a bit of a shout out to say thank you on, on twitter so let me play this and we will get on it sure. So that is our wonderful Ring of Fire. That uh, it's a fan favorite. Um, so if you could see on the bottom of the screen, Jody B at Jody Chapman on mm -hmm. Twitter. She is a writer. A debut novel, Another Life, is a BBC Two between the covers book pick. So fantastic! Well done to you. Uh, out April the first with Penguin Books, and she has two thousand five hundred nineteen followers, which is a bit more than normal. But she was the recent follower, so I thought you know we'll give her a shout out. So what we like to do is send them a GIF. A GIF, uh, animated GIF. And Casey, do you know what GIF we should send them? And I'm hoping you're going to say a certain thing here. A certain GIF? Yeah. Do you know animated GIFs on Twitter? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. GIF, GIF. I'll throw GIF, in that controversy. Kind of the same thing. Yeah. Uh, no, GIF, I like GIF better. Um, <laughs> what? I have to nominate the GIF? Yeah. Well, it could be anything. We've had, honestly, the most random things. We've had uh, cats. We've had dry shampoo. We've had uh, aliens, I think. I don't know. We've had everything. Uh, do I have to search for one now and send it? No, nope. uh, just any sort of theme, just a theme. Or oh, something. uh, let's go with cats. I mean, I'm a cat. <laughs> I was hoping for zombies. Come on, right? Everybody's uh, okay. no, no, no. all right, fine. Zombies, zombies. no, don't, don't go with cats. People like cats on our show. Um, everyone send cats or zombies or zombie cats if you can find those, that'd be great. They're uh, there, I've seen them, <laughs> yeah. Uh, to at Jody Chapman on Twitter. And while uh, they are doing that, um, Casey, is there an author 
this is the part where I ask, is there an author, or normally we have a, a book writer on the show, which you are, um, that you really kind of are into that you would recommend people to look into? Um, I, I'm a Stephen King fan. I mean, I, I, people don't know that Stephen King wrote Shawshank Redemption, uh, and Green Mile and, and, uh, the girl who loved Tom Gordon and just a, a plethora. I mean, probably one of the most diverse backgrounds in writing in terms of books and as a machine to get these mm. things done. Um, and, and was an, was an early inspiration for me, uh, in terms of, of doing these stuff like the stand, the stand was a really great book. Um, I, I haven't seen the new version of adaptation they've done uh, visually. I've seen all the previous ones, which were a little questionable. Uh, <laughs> the stand was actually like a little bit of an inspiration for We're Alive because I love the idea of people surviving. Yeah. And uh, that's always been a thing that I, I like watching and seeing because um, there's like a core theme that I, I really like in, in, in that aspect is what you put into the world is what you get out of it equally. Mm. And that's something that I think we've lost touch with, uh, especially in modern society is is you don't see that sort of exchange factor of effort. Um, and it's and some people have to work harder than others to get by. And, and I sort of like the idea of, of that equality act. Definitely. Um, guys, the next section of the show is the writing community question time. If you've got questions for Casey, for me, for both of us, now is the time. Put them in the chat and we will ask those. We will pop them up on screen. So send them in right now. Um, no, I agree, Casey. I love the sort of apocalyptic world and... Yes, the survival thing I like, but I also love kind of nature taking back Earth um, yeah. and kind of seeing like, you know, uh, I am legend when um, Will Smith drives through the city and, you know, it's all being taken back. I just kind of something really draws me to liking that. Uh, and that's I, actually something that I like love so much that I decided to jump into the future with We're Alive 17 years to build that back. Excellent. Like like what what would happen if the world continued on its pace after we're alive for another 17 years. And that mm. to me is a lot of fun because also what happens to the infected over 17 years, because yeah. they're incredibly adaptable. And then we get to see all the new manifestations of what they've become over wow. that time and how, how they're a much different adversary than what they used to be mm. back in our day. That sounds fantastic. Can't wait for that. Um, DJ Zay P um uh, dj zap uh, i'm down kc i think that's for the quiz so we might have a, a sweet potential quiz um yeah okay um i yeah, don't know what the quiz is about i'm like going like, you're gonna like do math questions no I no no <laughs> it, it is it is zombie based all right and i'm gonna oh, say that. Oh, really? I, I, yeah we'll see um okay so i have never say... seen the walking dead so if there's any walking dead questions i'm gonna be like there is uh i'm a big fan so i can help you out on that one okay, okay. Well, you have to help me out because uh, like it was one of those things that uh, literally we're alive. I wanted to be the next uh, that show on TV before it was ever out. Mm. And then once it started coming out, I didn't watch it because I didn't want to like start sub subliminally pulling things from that show uh, into my own. So I actually I have that's... never watched it. I think it's an amazing concept to ha actually block out these things because for me, uh, um, my book is zomb zombie orientated, definitely the first one. So I always kind of gone off my experiences of loving sort of shows and films and things like that. So for someone who's kind of kept away from that, you know, what was the zombie draw in the first place? Uh, well, no, I had, so before I wrote uh, We're Alive, I did watch a whole bunch. Uh, okay. uh, the, the original, like the classics. Yeah. Um, Oh, what was there was there was even like a, a a movie about a pet zombie. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. I'm sure somebody's going to get it. Um, uh, where yes. uh, I know what you mean. Yeah. It, so so I've I watched a lot of those. Uh, the Don of the, the Zack Snyder Don of the Dead. I thought was really great. Hmm. Uh, which which was funny because as a, as a, here's a whole circle of things. Uh, Mackay Pfeiffer, uh, who is in that movie. Uh, which was one of the inspirations for me for We're Alive, I actually directed on Bronzeville. So wow. it's like We're Alive got uh, w was was created because of him, but then Bronzeville became an audio show because they knew that I could produce We're Alive, which then cast him. So it's like this whole weird full circle thing. That's amazing. That is fantastic. Yeah. Um, there's something else I just want to ask you about very quickly as well. This may be connected um, for the two reasons. You created a custom gaming console. I did. I that did. Is, that is seriously impressive. 
Thank you. No, I uh, I was really big into emulations and and did a custom front loader based on like a an old loader called Maximus Arcade, where I literally would do batch script editing, where it would load up controller configurations uh, to where you just you're just playing a console and you're playing X on an Xbox controller, old Xbox 360, yeah. uh, and you're playing all these old games uh, that are then emulated through all these different emulators uh, instead of like so that way you can just sit back and relax and play. Yeah. Um, and, and not have to get involved with like, OK, going to the computer, load, file, you know, everything's there. You just push the game you want. Front loader does all the, the, the business for you in the back end and you just get to sit there and play. It's fantastic. Definitely. It, did that get anyway with um, sales or anything like that? Oh, no, I couldn't sell it. No, <laughs> that would be totally illegal. Um, um, you know, no, I did that. I did that just for myself. Some uh, black market job. <laughs> my own purposes. Yeah. Uh, cause I was like, I want to build one of these. And I, I did it. My, I first started with like a Mac mini and then I just kind of built out from there. Yeah. Uh, cause it, it was really awesome to actually build a, uh, a device that was able to up res a whole bunch of the older games that, that, mm. you know, you can't really play anymore. Um, I, I would, I went all the way back to Atari. Yeah. Uh, cause that's actually where I started was Atari 2600 when I was a kid and, uh, and, and replaying some of those, those, mm. those systems is pretty fun. It is. And can I can I just suggest it is that your love for the Mario Brothers? Oh yeah, no, I have a huge love for the Mario Brothers. I, I have like every amiibo that's been made. Uh, <laughs> I, I I have on top of like I'm still you know crunching through Super Mario 3D World, the new one. That's uh, mm. it's got uh, is it Bowser's Revenge? I forget the name of it now. Um, I'm just going through all that stuff. Big fan of Mario Galaxy. Like I'm. Yeah. I've been I've been into it uh, for ever since Super NES when my friend had the console and I never did, uh, and then I finally got my own uh, eventually with the the Wii uh, and just you know Mar it's one of those things where I can play with my kid and yeah. I don't have to worry about the content and the great thing about these these games is it's not about graphics it's not about what looks great it's about the playability which to me is all about what gaming is. I mean that's still my favorite Mario. I think going back to the original um, the NES with Super Mario. I love that game. Yeah. The Super Mario uh, World. Uh, I mean, yeah. there are so many like little things where you have to like do the bouncing trick underneath the platform in order to get where you need to go. Like that is game it, alone, uh, I think, is one of the, the best Mario platforms of all time. Is this the reason for this picture? Yes. And yes. I'm have... a big Smash Bros fan, too, because I actually yeah. did like uh, some competitive uh uh competitive gaming for a while that's actually if you look close there's me as an amiibo by pac-man where's that oh wow that's amazing yeah <laughs> i had a student uh a former student do that one for me uh when smash bros came out um i i took a picture of all the amiibos uh because uh i just was you know so into them uh and i'm also a big smash bros fan like i do tournaments with my friends and it's it's one of these games where it's sort of like equal playing field you come in Ooh. you have the same controller it's the skill that's such <laughs> So go on then. Could you pick a favorite character? Villager. Right, okay. Very that's easy. quick, very quick. Yeah, Villager. And then uh, that's, that's been my main for the longest time because uh, if you actually look, there's actually a custom Villager uh, standing right next to me that nobody else has. Uh, so there he is right there next to me. That's this a custom one, one a custom okay, paint okay. job. So I actually have all the Villagers, all the variants customized. I, I had a friend do them. Uh, a long time ago fascinating uh, but yeah no i'm big big amiibo fan <laughs> <laughs> okay let's have a look for some questions from the community and then we can get the quiz in just to finish off with dj uh, z dj z i'll say well saying that i'll have to send you a link somewhere um message us on on twitter very quickly um right. before we jump into that i, I can give uh, a couple things i know we didn't talk about it but um, there are a couple extra projects that are going to be coming out this year, yes. uh, aside from Bronzeville, for people to keep a lookout um, if they're curious about what we've been working on. Because uh, while We're Alive has been on hiatus, going through the, the back channels of getting funding and everything, uh, we have uh, two Audible productions that are going to be coming out this year. One of them is called Motel Evil. The other one is is a is actually a partnership with a, a gaming company in Audible that I can't mention the name of it yet. But it's pretty well known, and it's gonna be really fun that uh, that I was able to to write a, a new story part of. Um, and then also uh, later this this summer, we're gonna be uh, recording a western. So mm. a lot of really fun productions that are gonna be coming out in this next definitely, year. Definitely, definitely excited for that. Um, okay, Halo Scott, first question: uh, Who would you kill for their voice? Gary 
Oh, I mean, like, I want the person to I, die, or I want to catch. <laughs> That's a I very imagine, like, that's a double double edged sword there. I, I like yeah. hate their voice so much that I don't want to hear them at all. I think um, it's the other way. I think who would you kill to steal their voice? Gary Oldman. Okay, uh, okay. Gary Oldman, and the re not so much their voice. It's because of the acting ability behind it, mm. uh, and their how they can disappear in a role. Uh, Gary's been one of those char those those people that uh, is one of the best character actors I think that's ever existed. Um, and uh, and I have I have cosplayed as. Uh, <laughs> as one of his characters in the past from Harry Potter. Um, and so I would just really very much uh, love to work with him uh, in, in some sense in the future. That'd be amazing. That's a fantastic answer. Okay, moving on. Uh, Anya Pavel. Uh, what Sirius is the Black, that's his name. I lost it yes. for a second there. Yeah. <laughs> what is the perfect weapon to defeat the infected with? Your brain. Your brain? Your mind, oh, being that's, able a, to that's a bit of a cheap answer. Uh, it is a cheap one. Um, I think the uh, if I was to uh, be so bold, I'd say uh, making traps. Yeah, I, I think is probably one of the, the better ways, because then it's not in front of you. If they're if you draw them into something like it, it, if, say, for instance, you uh, made a pit that I had Ooh. a whole bunch of, you know, spikes on the bottom and uh, and all of a sudden they had a, tra a trap floor and you had like a right above it was something that drew them in and they just went in there. The, the greatest uh, defense is an offense in that situation. So I agree. I agree. Have you ever read uh, Max Brooks' Wood Was He? Uh, that's another one I actually haven't because of the Where Live Cross. I mean, I've gotten some pieces of it, uh, and oh. I know it has a really big spectrum of a lot, all over the world, but it's not one that I've actually gone through word for word. It was one of the most amazing world builders uh, books I've ever read, and just the amount of thought that went into it from seeing uh, things unfold from space to... And I was just thinking this because of what you said, uh, the barricade in the castle, that would be, an, you know, we're living in Wales, there's lots of castles, mm -hmm. it might be an option for me, but then realize that they actually siege themselves in with the dead, and then they dug out a tunnel, uh, spoilers perhaps, um, and that actually was way too short, and then they all just came in through the tunnel and killed everyone. Yeah, especially when we're alive, our world, they, uh, tunnels are a thing that they, they live in, they, they're, yeah. they're a subterranean uh, sort of species in a way, because uh, in, in some instances in our history so were we yeah um oh i've put a question up there i didn't mean to put up but it's there um will we ever hear more from tanya and her research on the infected absolutely uh even though that character uh may not be present uh in a story does not mean that their research doesn't live on so mm -hmm. there's a lot of background still involved in it and actually uh if you dig through some reddit posts you might actually find some tanya journals of, of some of her time after uh, the Where Life story ended, where she went out into the world and did a whole bunch of research to do some, uh, like, what is out there in the world. And she actually did a lot of uh, background on some of the subspecies that we now see in the future. That's amazing. Well, there's certainly a lot to get our, our teeth into, as it were. Um, so we will see very shortly if, if we do get joined uh, for the quiz. But um, where can people get hold of your book? And, and more importantly, where can they listen to the podcast? Or, sure. Or so um, all of our all of our material uh, is available on WaylandProductions.com. That actually has it has a link to Bronzeville. It has a link to We're Alive. It has a link to uh, a couple other experimental shows that are out there that we did uh, that are pretty fun. Even things like uh, we have a channel called Theater for the Mind, which actually has some like one offs that we did that are, mm. that are pretty fun uh, as sort of sound experimentations. There's even. Uh, there's even one, it's a short story about a, uh, uh, a, a boy who's trapped in their house who ends up like talking to their cat and their couch <laughs> and their refrigerator and things like this. Like all the objects inside their world actually have voices, which works in an audio drama. Uh, and, and like retellings of the Raven and stuff like that. Pretty, pretty fun stuff. So WaylandProductions.com has a lot of that. Uh, and then the other resource is We'realive.com in case you're looking for all, all stuff We're Alive based. Uh, it's all on the podcast. Every single episode is there. Uh, and then if you're interested in the book, it's actually through bombsalwaysbeep.com. Uh, mm -hmm. You can get an ebook or a, a printed version. It's actually also on Audible, or not Audible, but Amazon now. Uh, we are making an Audible version of it. It's just not done yet. It's taking a little time. Fantastic. I, I honestly 100% recommend uh, The We're Alive, the entire series. And um, Bronzeville, I'm seriously very dedicated to right now. So <laughs> certainly you, check whole, you have a whole bunch more episodes coming out this season. Uh, episode two drops tomorrow. Excellent. Episode, episode season two. 
Okay, we have someone joined. Let's see if this works, because this has right. gone out to, to someone we haven't met before. So hello to you. Hello, uh, this is uh, DJ um, ZP. Hey, in. ZP. Hey, what's up? How's it going? <laughs> good, good. <laughs> yeah. How, so. how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. I just uh, got back from um, work. And, you know, I just thought I'd tune in and check in. So. Yeah, yeah. You know you're talking to Casey Wayland, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Jay, have we, have we talked before by chance? Yes, we have. Uh, we ha- on I remember you. Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. How, how do you find Clubhouse? Um, It's an audio platform. It's like, um, mm. it's basically like something that you uh, go in and, and meet others. Um, yeah. And... Just oh, I, I'm on there. I just, audio. I, it's really fun. Yeah, I just haven't really used it. So I'm just trying to get your feedback. And do you think it's kind of a, a good thing going forward? Uh, yes. Uh, please hold on one sec. I have to... Let me see. No worries. What I'll do is when you're just sorting that out, I will get the quiz ready. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Is that your chores? Uh. <laughs> Are you ready for the quiz? Yes. What's your zombie knowledge know. like? Uh, I'm sorry? What's your zombie knowledge like? Oh, um, like just uh, like general zombie knowledge? Or yeah. What? It's pretty good. I would say it's Ooh, pretty good. Okay, okay. Good, good. I got I to gotta get a partner on this. All right. So, so what I'll do, <laughs> yeah. So what I'll do is I will ask Casey a question first, and if he answers it, he gets one point. But if he passes it and you get it right, you get two points. Oh, okay. Okay, Ooh. so if we start with Casey. Thanks. Yeah. Casey, first question. There's 10 questions. Um, All right. Which film first introduced the concept of zombies eating brains? Would that be Night of the Living Dead? Uh, there is multiple choice. i got to put this out to you. Yes. Uh, so we have Voodoo Island, The Return of the Living Dead, Night of the Living Dead, or Zombies of Moratura. So I, I get it. Yes. Um, what did you say? Sorry. I said neither living dead. Um, unfortunately, it's the return of the living dead. Oh. Uh, wow. So we have no power for that answer. I do apologize. I didn't realize that I had. Uh, I didn't know it was multiple. Okay. I, yeah. Oh, well, zero points. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, over to you then, DJ. All what right. real life insect is susceptible to a zombie like virus? Is it uh, a leaf cutter bee, gypsy moth caterpillar? Damp wood termite or Asian tiger mosquito? Mm, you can pass this. or you can answer. Um, God, um <laughs> the names were like uh, the third option. I think it was damp. Uh, damp, damp wood termite. Damp wood termite. Uh, well, Casey's nodding, but I, I don't know where I got this information from. But apparently, the answer is a gypsy moth caterpillar. Really, I. Wow. S- because think... uh, there is a bug that would get uh, a certain sort of fungus in their brain, and then they would end up climbing up. I thought it was a termite. Again, on this show, never yeah. rely on factuals to be correct, because <laughs> this is the right community chat show. Um, I, I went off the internet. Let's have a look. So going back to Casey, um, where did George A. Ramirez's Night of the Living Dead take place? Was it in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Texas, or Connecticut? Connecticut. Are you? Is that your answer? Are you going to pass, or are you going to? I'll say Connecticut. I mean, answer a different answer. You could pass it also uh, to, to to Jay and see if, if if he gets a better answer. Okay, I'm going to pass it because uh, that Casey, that's not correct. If, DJ, do you have an answer? Um, I was out. Uh, I wasn't going to say Pennsylvania. Is that your answer? Yes. Yeah, we have a we have a two pointer there. Um, I was either going to be Pennsylvania <laughs> or Connecticut, and I was like, I wanted to say Connecticut because it was smaller, more obscure. Mm. But so, so I'm glad this question is not going to you, uh, Casey. For what yeah, you I'm said. zero for zero right now. Which TV series tells the story of Rick Grimes who wakes from a coma to discover a world overrun by zombies? Is it Zed no Zed Nation, I Zombie, Pandemic, or The Walking Dead? Oh, uh, I might have to pass on that one. Okay, okay. Casey? Walking Dead. <laughs> yes, it is. The Walking Dead. I mean, I do the concept for the show. I, I mean, know, come on. Other than that, 
That's, that's about as much as I know. <laughs> okay, so back back to Casey is two two. Uh, Woo, what what breed of dog? <laughs> what breed of dog uh, plays a big role in Resident Evil? Don't worry is it sure. is it a German Shepherd, a Rottweiler, Doberman, or Great Dane? Doberman. Doberman is correct. Excellent. Uh... He takes the lead very quickly. <laughs> okay, DJ, do you drink? Oh uh, no. No. Okay. What alcohol would you use to mix a zombie cocktail? Would it be vodka, rum, mid, midori, uh, or creme de menthe? Um, I'm going with vodka. Uh, you go with vodka. Um, I'm going to pass it across because that is not the correct answer, Casey. Uh, creme de menthe. Not correct either. It was rum. 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 rum yeah. I've actually had zombie with vodka, by the way. I thought vodka was the right answer. Uh, it probably should be. Um, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, whose question is this? Casey's? Sure. Yep. Okay. Why not? Uh, according to Har- uh, Harvard in... in enter- what? what is that? Entobotomist? Entobotomist. Uh, Entobotomist. Botanist is study of plants. So... Okay. Entho would be... Uh, in- Planetary? I don't know. According to him, uh, a living person can actually be turned into a zombie using the flesh of a what? Um, a gila monster, a stonefish, black mamba, or puffer fish? I don't really know what that means, but, you know. Uh, this is interesting. Mm. Uh, gila monsters are venomous. Stone... Wait, can I go back? Oh, sorry, I was putting the... Yeah. What's it? Um, stonefish. I don't think stonefish. Black mamba is a snake. Or pufferfish. Pufferfish doesn't have much on the skin. I'm gonna go with black mamba. Passing it across to DJ. Oh, Ugh. it's one of the other three. Just, just have a guess, because you can pull it back even here. Um, no, you can take the lead here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Wait, what other th- wait, which one did he say? I, didn't even hear what I said Black Mamba. It's Gila oh, Monster, Mamba. Stonefish, or Pufferfish left. Um, I'm going to go with Stonefish. You are incorrect. It is a Pufferfish. Uh, a Pufferfish skin? Your question, you, you're appealing every one of these. I mean, I, this is off a, off a website, so um, please take it up with them. Uh- <laughs> well, I mean, there's different types of Pufferfish. There's dog face Pufferfish, Porcupine Pufferfish. I mean... I, uh, I've never seen. I was an aquarist for a while. Were you uh, really? Yeah, and I know you oh, can't wow. eat puffer fish because of uh, even though fugu is a really tasty fish, it's also very poisonous okay. as well, and you could die by eating it. So we talked about this just now, but this is over to DJ. Is it? Yes. Um, mm-hmm. According to Max Brooks' Zombie Survival Guide, what is the safest manner of transport during a zombie apocalypse? Is it a helicopter, boat? tank or running according to his survival guide I won't say boat nailed it uh, according to his survival guide the answer is boat boat huh I mean I guess they don't have them in the ocean in, in Max Brooks world no there was, yeah, there, was no, there, <laughs> there was a conversation behind that um, uh, an answer to that so we've got three left uh, I mean a helicopter I mean, a helicopter, get... there's no possible way they're going to be flying. No, but you're going to yeah. run out of fuel. True. That's yeah. true. Yeah, and and it depends on where you land that you might not be able to, you might land in a worse place, I guess. I, uh, I guess I guess that's fair. I guess it's fair. You can't run out of fuel on a boat and just fall out of the sky. You've but, got to... I mean, we're talking about the safest mode of transportation. You still got to pull into ports with a boat. Um, yeah. And if, if you watched uh, the spinoff... Um, Fear the Walking Dead. That actually didn't work out very well for them going on the boat either. So yeah, uh, we did that in our live first. Just, just saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, two more, two more. Um, so back to Casey. This is tense now. Two more. Uh, mm. We're even. Mm-hmm. Zombie sharks apparently. Halo. Um, in most stories, zombies can't swim. No. Boats can Ours sail. They can. Yeah. Um, okay. According to. Uh, he ate in folklore. Um, how do you, that Haitian? How yeah. do you free a zombie? Do you spray it with holy water, feed it salt, pray for it, or decapitate it? 
Is this me or? Uh, it's you, Casey. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because actually, they they uh, this was a real thing where they would. Um, well, I, the answer is, is is eluding me at the moment. I'm thinking about it. But what they did was uh, the like voodoo people would would uh, essentially you would ingest a type of frog to make you feel like you're dead, uh, and then they would exhume the body and then experiment on the body. Uh, it was kind of crazy. So yeah, um, spray with holy water, feed it salt, pray for it, decapitate it. How would you kill it? According to the Haitian folklore, yes. I'm going to go to decapitate it. No. Oh, we've got to pass it. I'm sorry. Ah, dang. <laughs> I think I'm I surprised you knew all that information about, you know, feeding it a frog, but you didn't know the answer to that. I mean, if they fed it a frog and decapitated it, it kind of wouldn't work right. Yeah. But then again, I mean, it could, I mean, all these things are kind of weird too. So <laughs> I was like, maybe because they, they pull a lot from like this, this lore of the original Haitian zombie thing. Mm. Um, which, which was, it's also kind of weird because it's such a tropical climate that that's part of the problem is you have to bury the body so quickly because they can't be let to be stagnant on the surface. Yeah. And that's what led to these things being done with these, uh, voodoo people. Come on then, DJ, you could take yeah. this away right here. We've got one question after this. All right. Um, I guess I will say, uh, spray it with, uh, water. Oh, it's going to be a 10 10 because the answer is feed it salt. Um, oh. So we are 3 3 going Salty. into the last question. Yeah, feed definitely. Salt. So basically dehydrate it. I guess, uh, oh, I, I guess I so. Mean, I, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Like dehydrate <laughs> it. And, How are you going to feed it salt, though, if it's. If, uh, it's just just throw know. handfuls at it and just hope for the best. I mean, I don't know. Open wide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, DJ, to win the game, basically, so try not to get this wrong. Uh, the 2000, which 2009 novel combined a classic Regency romance novel with slavering hordes of the undead? Uh, was it Lady Chatterley Zombie, Wuthering Zombies, Crano Die Zombie, or Pride and Prejudice and Zombies? Oh, man. I only know, like, two of those books, too. Um... I know the answer on this one. <laughs> oh, if you miss it. I got it. I got <laughs> this, is, this one. <laughs> this is for the win. This is for the win. Hey, um, is it the Pride and the Prejudice? Uh, you no. tell me. What's your answer? Yeah, yeah. I want to say it's the. Um, I'm going with the Pride and Prejudice and Zombie. That's right. Dun dun dun! We have a winner, and uh, DJ is the winner. <laughs> I oh. lost. <laughs> I concede. Uh, I concede. And, and you said she actually knows this, Pride and Prejudice. You did get that right, yes. Uh, well done. How do you feel? Uh, it feels great. Yeah. It feels <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, what's, have you got any suggestions what Casey should do next? Um, any suggestions? Yeah. What can, he, what can he do outside the zombie world? What's, what's next in it? What, what should he do? Eat lunch. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Um. I just. What genre would you like to see? Um. Or here. Excuse me. Here. Yeah. yeah. Here. As far as like audio um dramas. Yeah. No. I was kind of thinking of like uh maybe something like uh like a uh, um I don't want to like directly copy off of like I don't know. I want. I was thinking something more of like, um, like sci-fi type thing, and like, oh, nice, okay, in like in space or something. You know, you know, using like... Lawrence Fishburne, bring back Event Horizon. That's what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, uh, DJ. Thank you so so much for joining us for the quiz. Yes, thank you. Um, look after before, yourself. before you go, I will say there is a story sitting in my back pocket that I'm waiting for We're Alive to be over with, called The Modern Man, which might fulfill that want. Wow. Mm, there you go. Okay. This is an exclusive. All right. And I've been okay. working on it since 2002. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Right. Thank that's you, DJ. Cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, speak Cheers, to you mate. soon. Stay safe. Yes. Thank you. You too. Yeah, those dishes done. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. All right. Okay.
Well, how do you feel after losing that? I mean, I thought you'd have that in the bag, to be honest with you. I thought I might get a little bit better than I did, but you know what? I'm going to be okay with it. Yeah, I think you know, you'd be good. I, I, you can't know everything, and, and what I, you don't know, you can always find out. It, and I a learned shame. a little bit today. Yeah, it's a shame Huli's not here, because I make sure that every guest each week tries to beat him as best as possible. Uh, but, you know... You were, I guess, uh, the co-host in this respect, so you had to lose. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, all I can say, Casey, is thank you so, so much for joining us. And honestly, for me, it's an absolute pleasure to speak to you each time. And I hope that, you know, down the line, we can keep speaking about more and bigger things. And, and I can't wait to see what happens with um, uh, Bronzeville now. And whatever comes out from We're Alive, I will be 100% behind and backing and following. So thank you so, so much. And guys, go out and buy... Uh, Bombs always bleep because um, if you want to know in that world, there's a lot to learn and you have the expert here to give you all that information. So thank you so much. Cheers. Thanks for having me, Chris. Uh, guys, thank you on the chat for tuning in. And as always, we really appreciate you tuning in, spending your time with us. Please do support the uh, the Beer Token promotion today and buy a pre-order um, Marcus Echo's book. The The trailer is amazing. And um, I'm sure... Has anybody tried to call that number, by the way? <laughs> I'm very, I, I, was like, I thought I was like, that's... Hmm. Yeah, I'm longer. not sure. Um, anyway, I'm not sure. But be safe again. We'll see you on Wednesday with an, another great guest. We've got a great week for you guys this week. So please, please stay safe and please tune in. And uh, we'll see you very soon. Thank you, guys. Bye.